This time on Landmarks, we visit the glorious Sagrada Familia. The mighty pyramids of Giza. Then spin a prayer wheel at the Batala Palace and go in search of the real Atlantis. But first... The Great Barrier Reef is one of the seven natural wonders of the world and is the only living organism that can be seen from space. A World Heritage listed area, the reef stretches more than 2,000 kilometres along the coast of far northeastern Australia. Made up of billions of tiny organisms, almost all of the world's 400 known types of coral and 1,500 species of fish live here. The Great Barrier Reef is composed of more than 3,000 individual reefs and 900 islands. Coral reefs are ancient habitats. Successive ice ages lowered the sea level and after each, the coral re-established itself. It's a spectacular sight that attracts overseas visitors and contributes to the nearly 3 billion euro a year that Australia makes from ecotourism. It gives national conservation efforts added impetus. In 2001, fishing was banned on a third of the 34 million hectare marine park. More marine sanctuaries mean more fish and varieties of marine life. Agincourt Reef is just one of nearly 3,000 that make up the huge expanse of the Great Barrier Reef. Concentrating tourism in this area, and others like it, means that most of the reef remains undisturbed. Every year, tens of thousands of visitors come to the area. By coming out on a tourist vessel, such as this one, it's probably the only way a lot of these people are actually ever going to see the reef. So by coming out here, we hope that uh, we can give them a great experience, educate them somewhat as to what the reef is, what it's all about, how it works. And through that education, hopefully comes some understanding. And through the understanding comes the, the desire to protect it and look after it. Preserving the reef is not just of benefit to tourists. Scientists are discovering a new source of potential medical breakthroughs. One example is the deadly marine snail, the cone shell. Scientists believe its deadly venom could be the source of a new family of powerful pain-relieving drugs that could rival morphine. We have to be careful, of course. <laughs> and uh, so in collecting these, we wear thick gloves, usually just gardening gloves, and we carry a pair of barbecue tongs, all basic equipment, and um, we put them into a hard plastic box, like a lunch box. But as with many areas of the planet, pollution is a growing threat. Some of the damage to the reef is blamed on fishing, and some on land-based erosion, such as soil swept down rivers from farms after heavy rain. Despite conservation efforts, the crown of thorns starfish has grown to plague proportions. A single starfish can consume up to six square metres of reef in a year. Some 20 million crown of thorns have been destroyed in eradication programs in the Indo-Pacific region over the last 20 years, but as fears of global warming continue, crown of thorn numbers have multiplied. And they haven't been there in numbers for some considerable time. And there's some very critically important corals in the Whitsunday area that are under threat. In the past decade, conservation events have been better coordinated. The Australian government has implemented a program to help manage the massive job of running one of the largest marine parks in the world. There's lots of other things that need to happen for the protection of the reef. And you're probably aware of the issues of water quality and the unsustainable fishing type practices. All those are being addressed through other means. So the representative areas program was obviously a very important uh, part of it, but it's certainly not the only step that we're doing or need to do. Coming up, the Sagrada Familia. Human imagination knows no bounds. 
but often the ability to realise an idea takes generations. Barcelona's most famous landmark, the Sagrada Familia, or Holy Family Cathedral, is a fine example of how an incredible dream can become a fantastic reality. The imaginative and intricate design sprung from the mind of Catalonian architect Antoni Gaudi, a late 19th century modernist. Work on the cathedral began in 1882 and he was to work on the building for the next 40 years, devoting his final 15 years exclusively to the project. Every part of the design of La Sagrada Familia is rich with Christian symbolism, as Gaudi intended the church to be the last great sanctuary of Christendom. Its theme is the biblical account of the Nativity, the birth of Jesus at Christmas, and it's ornamented in a Baroque fashion with motives of animals and plants. Gaudi's building attracts millions of tourists from around the world. A Gaudi-designed hotel was submitted in the competition to replace the now-destroyed World Trade Center Twin Towers in New York. The plans were based on Gaudi's 1908 design for the then world's biggest hotel. Those submitting the plans claim the hotel was even planned for the same site. The futuristic design remains relevant and has struck a chord with some New Yorkers. It's so beautiful and it looks so modern. Absolutely amazing. I think this city is beautiful and unique as it is, and with that, it would just bring a new spirit. Gaudi died in 1926 with his masterpiece unfinished and was buried in its midst. The design is now being completed based on reconstructed versions of the lost plans. Jordi Bonnet's father works side by side with Antoni Gaudi. He is completing his father's work as chief architect of this project. La informática is avui... Today, we try to combine computer technology with the old ways to try to achieve Gaudi's elaborate form of architecture. His way to define arches and columns make it indispensable nowadays to use advanced technologies so we can gain some time to finish the building. The church's construction began in the days of manual labour and has lasted through to the computer age. A diamond tooth saw, guided by laser, is used to cut the huge stones to an accuracy of within a millimetre, so they can follow the original plans precisely. We insert the digital data from the models into a computer that later passes the information to a three-dimensional copier that makes models in wax or yeast. We then hand them to the artists, who assemble them in order to prepare the models for the laser saw. After Gaudi's death, the pace of construction slowed until the mid-1950s and now two facades and eight towers have been completed. The central area, the nave, was roofed in 2000. The plans call for a total of 18 towers, reaching between 90 and 120 metres. They will surround the largest tower dedicated to Jesus Christ. At 170 metres, it will be the tallest church in the world. When it's complete, this massive church will be able to host a congregation of 13,000 people. We don't really know when the church will be finished, maybe 30 years from now, maybe more. We will start building the biggest tower in a couple of years. We can't know mainly because with technology advancing so fast, it's difficult to make forecasts. They're one of history's most enduring landmarks and a must-see attraction for travellers to Egypt. Every year, thousands of visitors flock to see the pyramids near Cairo. The site contains the Great Pyramid of Khufu, the Pyramid of Khafre, the Pyramid of Menkari, eight subsidiary pyramids and thousands of old kingdom tombs. The Great Sphinx also lies on the site in an old kingdom quarry. The ancient monuments are the last remaining original wonders of the world, but they're suffering both from the ravages of time and rough treatment. 
Legend has it that Napoleon's soldiers shot off the Sphinx's nose with a cannonball in the 18th century. However, illustrations predating the French occupation show the Sphinx was noseless in earlier times. When the Giza pyramids were completed, they were encased in limestone and tipped with gold. The outer casing has worn off over the years, with only Menkari's pyramid retaining any of its original stonework. The giant structures were built as tombs for the pharaohs who ruled Egypt in ancient times, but their exact dates of construction remain a mystery. Some experts estimate they are around 10,000 years old, but radiocarbon dating and archaeological work have been unable to confirm this. Whatever their age, there is no doubt that they were an unsurpassed feat of engineering. The 60 to 80 ton stone blocks were transported from a quarry hundreds of miles away and put together with amazing precision. Archaeologists recently discovered the quarry used to build the pyramids, about 600 miles south of Cairo, buried under 100 cubic metres of sand. The chunks of stone were hewn from the quarry and transported by boat along the Nile River. Archaeologists also found an inscription at the quarry that suggested King Tutmosis III asked his architect to cut obelisks for a temple to his father, the sun god Amun-Ra. While there's some debate about exactly how long it would have taken to build the pyramids, given the amount of stones used, the construction phase would have to have taken at least 20 years, and probably longer. However, some archaeologists speculate that unknown technological advances might have made it possible for work to be done more quickly, as Cheops, the pharaoh who built the Great Pyramid, only reigned for 23 years. No matter how many years it took to build, Cheops's legacy has survived for thousands more. But now there's a new threat to the pyramid's survival, modernity. Tourists from all over the globe come to admire the magnificent crumbling ruins, but ever-increasing visitor numbers and generally uncontrolled tours around the area have been causing concern. Today is a very important day in the history of the Giza Plateau because we're starting today the conservation and the preservation of the pyramids. We just finished building a wall around the uh, pyramids because many people believe that pyramids are in the desert. They're not in the desert anymore. They're almost in downtown. We need to isolate the pyramids from the house, houses and therefore this wall has been built. It will protect the pyramid and it will limit the access of anyone to enter the plateau will be under our control. Hopefully this protection will prevent damage to the treasured monuments and preserve them for future generations. Coming up, the Patala Palace. Some buildings have significance beyond their architectural value. The Patala Palace in the Tibetan capital of Lhasa is one. The UNESCO World Heritage Site is situated at a height of 12,000 feet, nearly 4,000 metres, overlooking the Lhasa Valley. A grand architectural achievement, the most significant building in the once mysterious mountain kingdom, the Patala also remains a holy place, the seat of Tibetan Buddhism. The Patala is an immense structure, its interior space being in excess of 130,000 square metres. The palace was originally built to provide a residence for the Dalai Lama and his large staff. It was also the seat of the Tibetan government, where all ceremonies of state were held. It housed a school for religious training of monks and administrators, and it was one of Tibet's major pilgrimage destinations because it held the tombs of past Dalai Lamas. Within the White Palace are two small chapels dating from the 7th century. They are the oldest surviving structures on the hill and also the most sacred. It was from here that the 1959 Tibetan uprising against the Chinese occupation began. Its failure forced the 14th Dalai Lama, seen here, 
and thousands of others into exile. The Dalai Lama and many of his followers now reside in the foothills of the Himalayas in Dharamsala in northern India. Unlike most other Tibetan religious structures, the Patala survived relatively intact. It was not sacked by the Red Guards during the 1960s and 70s, apparently through the personal intervention of Chu En Lai. As a result, all the chapels and their artefacts are very well preserved, despite the last known renovation being in 1922. But finally, the building has been the subject of Chinese renovation. More than 40 million US dollars was spent on restoring the 13-storey, 400-year-old palace. No one has argued about the need to maintain the Tibet Autonomous Region's most important building. The most critical thing for us is to continually protect the Patala Palace. We work on this every year. It is different from other structures. It needs to be painted and the wood panelling needs to be replaced on a yearly basis. This way we can keep it in good condition for some time. In recent years, China's rapid economic expansion has extended to Tibet. However, throughout the Patala's renovations, there were concerns about the quality of the work being carried out. Currently, we are dealing with a twofold issue whether we are using good cement and whether Tibetan workers are used for the renovation work. In my view, as I have said before, workers of other nationalities can't do this kind of work because it is Tibetan-style architecture. UNESCO, which supported the Batala's World Heritage listing, is just as worried about unsympathetic constructions in other parts of Lhasa. There are always uh, some uh, bad cases in the surrounding buffer zones, uh, buffer zone of the World Heritage property, some illegal demolition, some really intrusive uh, building. And in that respect, UNESCO would hope that the Chinese, particularly the Lhasa Authority, could do some uh, architecture design survey in, in compliance with the traditional building uh, code rather than just to build intrusive new buildings, I think, yeah. A railway between China and Tibet was recently opened, and a vast increase in tourist numbers has already begun, with the Patala Palace a must-see site for many visitors. Now that the renovation is complete, the task will be to maintain the earth, wood and rock structure for future generations. The Mediterranean island of Cyprus is one of the cradles of modern civilization, and stories from its ancient culture have been passed down to us. Some stories are the stuff dreams are made of, myths, and are proof that not all landmarks in this series need to be monumental or natural wonders. Iranian-American author Robert Samast is setting out to prove one is true. He believes the lost city of Atlantis lies near Cyprus. Through careful reading of ancient texts and cross-referencing with modern scientific data, he believes he has traced the location of the mythical super city. We believe that Atlantis is off the coast of Cyprus simply because when we lower the sea level of the eastern Mediterranean by about 1,650 metres and recreate the conditions of this area, uh, before the flood, what appears is an island that matches Plato's description of Atlantis to an un uncanny degree. It was the Greek philosopher Plato who first wrote of a super civilization that existed in prehistory, an amazing race who, when on the verge of conquering Athens, met with catastrophe and sank without trace. While many believe Plato had written a political allegory, the story has since captured the imagination of countless writers and explorers. Many have tried to prove its existence. But Samas insists the Greek Plato was describing a climate and vegetation similar to that of nearby Cyprus when he outlined life in Atlantis. Plato, who was alive around 400 BC, speculated Atlantis was thriving at least 10 millennia earlier. 
and would have enjoyed a climate similar to fertile Cyprus. I mean, the Egyptians said that these people were living to us about 11,000 years ago, and yet the way they're described is an incredibly powerful and yet gentle, loving and altruistic race. The city of Atlantis is said to have been the capital of the island nation. It had a large Acropolis-like structure in its middle and was surrounded by a circular wall. The city was built with temples, palaces, monuments, living quarters and bridges constructed on a mammoth scale. But Sir Mast has competition in claiming he knows the true location of Atlantis. Some believe it was in the Atlantic Sea. And there are many other Mediterranean islands who believe the super race were their ancestors. The Italian island of Santorini is one. And the equally ancient island of Malta, which lies 60 miles south of Sicily, is another. Better known these days as a holiday resort, the Maltese believe their antecedents were part of the action in every myth from Homer's Odyssey to Atlantis. But the search for ancient treasures always involves some pain. Dreams are free, but major projects cost money. Okay, so we're looking for megalithic structures, which means huge cut stone blocks. That's what's been described. Many, and it's not just one target, we're looking for a whole city. So Mast hopes to engage the Greek Cypriot salvage ship, RS which has the equipment and the crew he needs for deep sea searches. They were the crew who filmed the wreck of the Titanic, many miles below the surface of the Atlantic Sea. This robotic submarine can work at the one mile depth where Sir Mast believes Atlantis is located. But the project will cost a small fortune, which at the time of filming the author didn't have. Without backers, the search will remain a tantalising dream. Atlantis may yet again elude the clutches of the living. What's next is to verify what is currently a very good theory by uh, conducting an expedition and going to find the remains of Atlantis City. We believe there's quite a bit to be found there. Uh, Plato's description talks about a vast city. Yeah.